overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Romans 12, 21. Say that again. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Romans 12, 21. That's really hard, isn't it? Because you know what that means? And I just want to leave you with this thought this week. Good will triumph over evil. Do you believe that? Amen. You always do what's right. Someone one time was asking me, you know, Brother Mark, what am I supposed to do? You know what you do? You do what's right. You do what God said. You always do what's right. And guess what? When you do what's right, God will honor that. Did you know that? He will honor that. So whatever you're thinking today, Brother Mark, I don't know what to do next. Guess what you do? You do what's right. Always do what's right. Good will triumph over evil. You believe that? Let's continue to worship a good God. Amen? You are the everlasting God, the everlasting God. You do not faint, you won't grow weary. You're the defender of the weak. You comfort those in need. You lift us up on wings like eagles. You are the everlasting God, the everlasting God. You do not think you won't grow weary. You're the defender of the weak. You comfort those in need. You lift us up on wings like eagles. You may be seated. Not a God created by human hands. You are not a God dependent on any mortal man. You are not a God in need of anything we can give by your plan. That's just the way it is. You are not a God created by human hands you are not a god dependent on any mortal man you are not a god in need of anything we can give by your plan that's just the way it is you are god alone from before time began you were on your throne you were god alone and right now in the good times and bad you are on your throne you are god alone you're the only god whose power none can contend you're the only God whose name and praise will never end. You're the only God who's worthy and everything we can give. You are God, that's just the way it is. You are God alone, from before time began. You were on your throne. We're God alone, and right now, in the good times and bad, you are on your throne, you are God alone, you're unchangeable, you're unshakable, you're unstoppable, that's what you are, you're unchangeable. You're unshakable, you're unstoppable, that's what you are. You are God alone, from before time began. You were on your throne, you are God alone. And right now, in the good times and bad, you are on your throne. You are God alone, you're unchangeable, 
You're unshakable. You're unstoppable. That's what you are. You're unchangeable. You're unshakable. You're unstoppable. That's what you are. You are God alone. An unshakable, unstoppable, unchangeable God. That's the Almighty God who loves us. That's the Almighty God who's present with us right here in this service. What a great God who cannot be stopped, who can handle anything that life throws at us. Lost are saved, find their way at the side of your great name. All condemned, feel no shame at the sound of your great name. Every fear has no place at the sound of your great name. The enemy, he has to leave. At the sound of your great name, Jesus, worthy is the Lamb that was slain for us, the Son of God and man who are high and lifted up, and all the world will praise your great name.
We invite you to stand as we continue to worship the Lord in song. Grateful that we have a solid rock to stand upon this morning. Down on my knees, still in your own good time, you answer my pleas. Teach me not to rely on what others do, but to wait in prayer for an answer from you. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Teach me, Lord. Teach me, Lord, to wait. Teach me, Lord, to wait. While hearts are aflame, let me humble my pride and call on your name. Keep my faith renewed, my eyes on be on this earth what you want me to be. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not fade. Teach me, Lord, teach me, Lord, to wait. We're grateful this morning to have the opportunity to be in God's presence with God's people, to worship Him in giving. God is the great giver, amen? amen. He has done so much for us in our lives, and even in the dark times of life, when things just seem to be very chaotic and frustrating and perhaps maybe even dismal, God is still the great giver. He is the one who can give us the peace that we need, the comfort that our souls hunger for, and the love that our spirits crave. That's the great giving God that we serve. And so this morning we counted the privilege to give back to him. Because we recognize, number one, we can never outgive God. And number two, God is going to take our gift and He's going to use it in ways that are beyond anything that we can even begin to recognize. That's the kind of great God that we serve. So we encourage you this morning to give to the Lord with a grateful, cheerful heart, letting God give you the blessings for this opportunity of worship. Let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Brother Carl, would you lead us in this offertory prayer? Dear Lord, we ask you to come be with us, Lord, as we worship you and give you praise, Lord. And Lord, we ask you to guide Brother Mark as he leads us in prayer and worship, Lord. And Lord, you take this offering, Lord, and let's be done in your will, Lord, and it serves in you, Lord. And Lord, help us all to be better Christians and serve you, Lord, and serve your purpose on this earth and to help the people around us to raise them up, Lord. Amen. You may be seated.
invite you to take your bulletin and look in there. There's a printed prayer list. Several names just going to kind of bring to your attention. We do encourage you. Uh, many of you guys have been aware of that, but uh, Brother David Hubman passed away this week. His funeral is going to be Tuesday here at the church at 10 o'clock in the morning. So we encourage all of you that can be here, please come and be a part of that. Visitation will be Monday evening uh, from 5 to 7 at North Little Rock Funeral Home downtown and so if you can go by there uh, that evening or be here at the service with us on Tuesday morning we encourage you to do that obviously keep Lori and family in prayers as well uh, during a very difficult time uh, so just remember them please in your prayers also I want to encourage you to remember uh, Sister Bridner Rayburn and her family uh, her mom uh, has uh, come to the end of her life and they are headed over to be with their family uh, this week in Tennessee. So if you guys would remember to pray for traveling mercies for their family as they go there to be with her mom during this uh, few, last few days of her life. So please remember the Rayburn family, if you will. Also, Sister Twinkie Daly. I encourage you to remember her. Sister Twinkie had eye surgery, uh, had some bleeding in the eye. They went in and did some surgery. And I, some of you guys have probably been through this before. I don't always understand it all, but she has to keep her head at a downward tilt uh, because of what they did. And she can only look up for a certain few moments each hour. And so uh, it's going to be that way for a little while until that healing process begins. So if you guys would keep Sister Twink in your prayers, you know she would love to be here. And that impacts Miss Betty and Brother Gene as well. It's a lot going on there, so if you guys would remember to pray for both of them, I know uh, she would appreciate your prayers. Also, Sister Karen Skinner asked us to put Janice Skinner on our prayer list as well. She fell this morning, uh, so if you will, write down Janice Skinner as well. Other family members, other people that are on our prayer list, don't forget them. We're not trying to say not pray for them. Just kind of look down that list to remember we got a lot of things going on uh, with those in hospitals and going through tests and procedures and different things this week. So just take the opportunity to stop and pray. Uh, there's a lot happening, and we just want to encourage you to pray for one another. There will be other people that are traveling in for different events this week for the funeral. So I just want to encourage you to pray for those that are going through this time. The Lord will keep them safe as they travel as well. Brother Paul Cross, would you stand and lead us in prayer this morning?
There's a grace when the heart is under fire. Another way when the walls are closing in. And when I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. There was another in the fire standing next to me. There was another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding, oh, how I've been set free. There is a cross that bears the burdens where another died for me. There is another in the fire. All my dead left for dead beneath the waters. I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore. And should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning, either way I won't bow to the things of this world. And I know I will never be alone. There is another in the fire standing next to me. There is another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding what power set me free, there is a grave that holds nobody, and now that power lives in me. There is another in the fire. And I can see the light in the darkness as the darkness bows to him. I can hear the roar in the heavens as the space between wears thin. I can feel the ground shake beneath us as prison walls cave in. Nothing stands between us. Nothing stands between us. There is no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come what may in the space between all the things unseen and this reckoning. I know I will never be alone. There'll be another in the fire standing next to me. There'll be another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding how good you've been to me, I'll count the joy come every battle because I know that's where you'll be. There is another in the fire. 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 Aren't you thankful there's another in the fire? Wow. I invite you to take your Bibles, turn to the book of Isaiah, chapter 40. No, it's not the same as last week's sermon, just a different text. Isaiah, chapter 40. We've been working our way through this book, powerful book of Scripture, one of the longest books in the Old Testament, one of the major prophets. The question is often asked in our culture and really in many of our lives, why doesn't God do something to make this right? 
Why doesn't God do something to make this better? Life is hard. Many of us are facing difficulties in our life. So why didn't God do something? Why didn't He do something to make things just better in this world? Better in my life? Why didn't He do something? Isaiah was asked that same question back in chapter 5. As he began this whole prophecy to the nation of Israel. Now remember, Israel was in Babylonian captivity. So obviously this is a relevant question. They were asking it. If we're the chosen people of God, if God is our God and we are His people, then God, why don't you do something to make this better? We shouldn't be living in captivity. Maybe you have some things going on in your life right now and you're looking around saying, why didn't God do something? Why doesn't God do something? I need some help. If you're the God who's the everlasting God and you're the God as a creator and you're unshakable, and un- then God, you need to do something. You ever been there? Amen or oh me, right? Here we go. Stay with me. Because most of the time we answer this question in just the way it's been answered here in Scripture. One, there's a lot of people who say, well, God doesn't want to do anything. Verses 1 through 11 of our text. God doesn't want to do anything. He doesn't care. Or if you follow in verses 12 through 26, God can't do anything. He's unable to do anything. And that's probably how a lot of people in the culture right now are looking at that question. When they look around and say, well, why didn't God do something? Well, God don't want to, or God can't do anything. But Isaiah says, I can't understand that logic. And he wants to remind Israel, listen to me, church, God is not ignoring you. But God is greater than man. He don't work on our timetable. Nor does he have any of the limitations that we have. So what Isaiah is declaring to the people of God is he's saying, listen to me, God is at work. God is doing a work right now. And listen to me, you can depend on God. Begin reading with me in Isaiah chapter 40. I'm going to start reading verse 27. Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest over Israel? My, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God. Where's God? I'm hid from God. Why are you saying that, Israel? Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the Creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is He weary? Israel, have you heard that? Don't you know that, Israel? There's no searching of His understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, He increases their strength. Even the youth shall faint and weary, and the young man shall utterly fail. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Isaiah is saying, don't you remember who God is? You can trust God. You can depend on God. And let me tell you why you can depend on God. Maybe you're here this morning and listen to me. If there's one thing we've learned probably in this journey of life is there's not too many people you can depend on. (laughs) You can't depend on the government. Well, some people are trying. (laughs) Can't depend on the government. Can't depend on... Listen, there's not very many people in our lives. And all the things we thought we could depend on have come to what? Somehow or another to fail us. But Isaiah is telling the people of God, you can depend on God. Why is that true? Well, look at verse 27. He's trying to remind them, God has not forgotten you. He is a just God. If you go back in Isaiah chapter 49 and you kind of look ahead, and I know some of you guys are reading through the book, Isaiah says, listen to this, here's what he says, he's just talking to Israel, he says, does a mother forget her child? Rhetorical question, no. So if a mother does not forget her child, listen to me, God is not going to forget you. In fact, you know what he says there in in chapter 49, verses 14 through 16, he says, does a mother forget her child? No, our names are imprinted on his hands. He cannot nor will not forget his children. Did you know that? Now, let me show you what that means. This is a great picture. And if you don't know the history of this, you're not going to understand. You remember when a person became a slave. 
that usually the name of their master was imprinted upon their forehead. What Isaiah is giving the picture of here is just the opposite, that our names are imprinted on the hands of God. That our master, that the God, the creator of heaven and earth, stooped down low enough, listen to me, to have our names imprinted on his hands. He'll never forget us. He'll never forsake us. You see, Israel was the chosen people of God. God had made a covenant with them. And God had given himself to Israel as a special possession. Listen to me just for a moment. Follow this out. God had given himself to Israel as a special possession. They would be blessed, why? Because of that covenant that he made with them. Now, let me show you how this works. When you trust Christ as your Savior, listen to me, we make a covenant with God. So when we trust Christ, we have a covenant that we make with God. When we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we enter into that covenant of life with God. God is our God, and we are His children. So I go back and ask you the question, the same question that Isaiah asked Israel in, in, in chapter 49. Can a mother forget a child? No. Can a father forget his child? No. God has not forgotten you. Brother Mark, you don't know what I'm going through. You don't know the battle I'm facing. But I'm here to tell you, as a child of God, God has not forgotten you. He is still at work right now. He's working in your life. Look what it says there in the text. God, your way is not hid from God. The journey you're on right now, what you're experiencing today, the path that you're walking today, it was not hid from God. There's tr three amazing truths there. Now stay with me for a minute. When you read that text, what it means, that your way is not hid from God. Number one, that means God is leading His children. Think about it for a minute. God is leading the, child of, the children of God right now. How is He leading us? Well, it says through His Word. That your Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, right? So if you want to know where God's leading you, what do you need to do? You need to get into the Word. Some people say, well, Brother Mark, I don't know what God's doing. Get into the Word, because His Word is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. It'll tell you where you need to go and what you need to be doing. But also the work of the Holy Spirit is in our life. Romans chapter 8 verse 14 says this, For as many are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So you know what he's saying? Those who believe and trust in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit of God is leading you in your life today. Did you know that? Now this blows my mind when I always think about this. But God knew every one of us would be right here today. Did you know that? He knew it in eternity past. He, he already knew it. That you would be sitting in this service today knowing exactly what you're going to be going through today. God knew it. And let's, guess what? God is leading you down this path. Now, I don't know why. I don't know how. I don't know what the reason. I don't have all the answers. But I trust the Word of God and the will of God and the work of God. And God's saying, I'm leading you. Just follow me. Will you trust me? He's leading you. Second truth. God knows our sin. Ooh, that ain't good. The sins of Israel, he reminded them back in eight, chapter 8, verse 1. But I want to remind us, listen to me, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So when you don't look around and say, yeah, I know their failures. <laughs> listen to me. God knows your sin too. He knows my sin. He knows exactly. In Psalm 69, verse 5, it says, O God, thou knowest my foolishness. My sin is not hid from thee. You know what foolishness is? Anybody know what foolishness is? Ignorant. Ignorant. No, when, I, when I was growing up, me and my brother was going to get in trouble. And here's what my mom would say. You better quit that foolishness. Because we were doing something we shouldn't be doing. We, we knew we wasn't doing right. And she'd say, you know what you need to do? You need to quit that foolishness. God knows our foolishness. He knows when we're not doing what's right. He, he knows. 
So listen to me. If, we're, if God is leading us down the path, He knows every step that I take. Guess what? That means He knows my sin too. So what should I be doing? That means I should be repenting of my sin. I should be changing my ways. That's what my mom meant. You better quit that foolishness. You better quit what you're doing. Not only does he know my sin and my failures, but listen to me, God knows the way of joy that he's planned for me as well. Let me say that again. God knows the way of joy that he's planned for us. In Proverbs chapter eight, verse, I mean chapter four, verse 18, listen to what it says. It says, "The path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto that perfect day." Psalm 16 verse 11 says, "That will show me the path of life, and at thy right hand are pleasures evermore." Now listen to me, I don't remember, joy has nothing to do with circumstances. Joy has to do with my relationship with Jesus Christ. So God has me on a path of my life. God is leading me down a path to do what? Bring me to Him. So whatever that path may be, in my failures, in my sin, my struggles, my battles, listen to me, God has a perfect path for me to get to Him. And all the things that happen in my life are for what purpose? To bring me to Him. There is the place of joy. Now, can you have joy now? Yes, you can if you're walking with Christ. But maybe right now you're trying to figure out in whatever battle you're in, whatever struggle you're in, you can say, Brother Mark, there ain't no joy right here. Remember, joy ain't got nothing to do with circumstances. It has to do with my relationship with God. And at, listen to me, what did he say there? And at thy right hand are what? Pleasures, joy forevermore. You know what? We keep looking for joy in this world. You're not going to find it. Where are you going to find it? You're going to find it at the right hand of the Father. In the presence of the King. And God's trying everything He can in your life right now. He's putting you through some things, and I know there's struggles and there's battles, but what is He trying to do? He's trying to get you to Him. Now here's the hard part. Stay with me. Go back to verse 27. He said, And my judgment is passed over from my God. The Lord is just. I said that. Very beginning. The word just actually means judgment. Now stay with me because this is going to be hard. You've got to wrap your mind around this. God will not do anything that's unfair. He's just. God will not do anything that is untrue. God will not do anything that is inappropriate in any area of our life. Why? Because part of His nature is being just. He can never be unjust. So whatever God is doing, whatever God is doing in my life, I've got to trust Him that God is doing it for my good and for His glory. He is just. It will never be untrue. God will never lead me to untruth. God will never do anything that's unfair. Because a lot of times we look at our lives at things that happen and we say, Brother Mark, that's just unfair. You don't know what God is doing. You don't know where God is leading you to. It may be the greatest thing that happened in your life, but you don't know it right now, but you will one day. You don't understand it right now, but God does. So you've got to trust Him. That justice, that fairness is a part of the kingdom of God. Listen to me, and I've said this before from this pulpit, but all things will be made right in the eternal kingdom of God. I don't know what you're batting with. I don't know what you're struggling with. But listen to me. God's got all eternity to make it just, and He will. Go back to the account of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man had everything you can imagine in his life. Spend eternity in hell. Lazarus, a beggar. Dogs licking his wounds. Dies and he's in the presence of his Savior for eternity. Brother Mark, that don't sound right. How could a believer suffer like that in his life? Because God had a greater glory waiting for him in heaven. The rich man had it all, he thought. And lost it in a moment. 
God's working all things together. Why? To bring me to Him. Don't misuse Romans 8.28, please. God's working all things together for my good. The good is to get me to Him. And what do I have to endure in this life and whatever I have to struggle with in this life, it's worth it all if it brings me to Him. You believe that? God is just. Now here's the hard part. Justice is all, that justness is also is a characteristic of God, but He also expects it in my life as well. How I treat people. Isaiah chapter 56 verse 1 reminds us of this. Jesus taught us to be just people. What does that mean? Let me show you. Go to, go to Matthew chapter 5 just a moment. This, this characteristic, we love it in God, but listen, God wants it in our life. Matthew chapter 5. You know, this is a Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 5, you can start reading in verse 40. We don't normally like reading these verses because, man, they're just hard. It's practical. It said, If any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, give him thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go twain with him. To him that asketh thee from him that would borrow thee, turn him not away. You've heard it said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thy enemy. I say unto you, Love your enemies and bless them that curse you. <laughs> no. Do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father in heaven. You want to be like God? Here's what you do. I don't like that, Brother Mark. You see, what Jesus taught us was go beyond just being fair. I've heard so many people in this life say, and it, just, it almost makes me cringe now. Just give me what's coming to me. No, you don't want, you don't want that. I just want what's fair. No, you don't. Not from God, you don't. Christ is saying here in Matthew chapter 5, you've got to go beyond what's fair. You've got to treat people the way God treated you. Because if, listen to me, we deserve the wrath of God, right? The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We deserve death, but God gives us what? Life. God went beyond being just fair. He could have said, okay, I'm just not going to kill you. I'll just let you live this life. But he goes beyond that. He said, no, I'm going to give you abundant life and eternal life. Wow. That's beyond fair, right? I deserve death. He said, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. Not only am I going to give you life, I'm going to give you abundant life here, and I'm going to give you eternal life there. Wow. So if that's the nature of God, how can I not trust Him? If he's that kind of just God, how can I not depend on him? Go back to our text in Isaiah. Because in verse 28, he says, I can trust God or depend on God because he is tireless. You can read verse 28 there. It's a powerful verse. Hast thou known, have not heard that the everlasting God, we sang about it, is the Lord, the creator of all the ends of the earth. He fainteth not, he's not weary. Let me remind you simple truths here, and you know these. One, God is everlasting. He is not limited by time. Psalm chapter 90, verse 2 says this, Before the mountains were brought forth, or forever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from ever to la everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. So because God is everlasting, I can depend on Him. He's not here today and gone tomorrow. How many times has that happened in your life? Somebody's here one moment, and when you need them, <laughs> you ever, you ever, you ever, it is, it all, it is always amazing to me. It usually happens when you're in college. Man, people say, man, I'm your best friend. You ever need me, just call me. And you say, hey, we're moving next weekend. You can't get a hold of them for nothing. You know what I'm talking about? God does not, listen to me, everything, this is an amazing thought. Everything we know wears out or decays. Did you know that? It weakens over time. That's not true of God. The same God that created is the same God that's here today. He does whatever He wants, whenever He wants, on His timetable. He's the everlasting God. You can depend upon Him. Why? Because He's the Creator. 
Here's an amazing thing. God knows how everything works. He's not limited by resources. He's the creator and sustainer of all things. Read Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. An amazing text there. <clears throat> all things were created by Him and all things are sustained by Him. So guess what? You can depend upon that God. You know what? This is an amazing thought. Stay with me just for a second. I, as I went through this text, do you know what the sunrise means every morning? That there's a God you can depend on. How many times you woke up and the sun wasn't right, was not going to rise? It may not be up or risen once you, when you first get up, but guess what? Later on in the day, you know what it does? There it rises. Do you know what happens toward the end of the day? It sets. You know what that tells me? There's a God I can depend on. There's a God I can trust. No, not one time has the sun never not risen, as far as we know. Not one time has it never set in the moon. Not one time has the stars never came out. You know what that tells me? There's a God I can depend on. The God of the Creator of heaven and earth. He's omnipotent. You know, that's a big word we use. It just means He's all-powerful. He's not limited by the amount of power needed or the kind of power needed to accomplish His work. So whatever God wants and whatever God needs, guess what? He's powerful enough to get it done. Wow. Think about it for a minute. The miracles of Christ, God in the flesh. Physically, what did He do? He healed the blind, the lame. He raised the dead. He healed the crippled. Spiritually, the demon possessed, He removed those demons from them. Emotionally, He calmed the storm, taking care of their fear. Mentally, He gave them the parable so that they could understand. So God is not limited in any way. Whatever God wants to accomplish, God can accomplish. You're, I don't know what's going on in your life once again, but I'm here to tell you, God has the power and the ability to get it taken care of. God can do what He wants to do. He can do what we, he, we need Him to do in our lives. God can do it. And if God can do it, guess what? You can depend on Him. You can depend on Him. Let me give you another big word. Stay with me for a minute. God is omniscient. You know what that means? He's all-knowing. That's all it means. God knows everything. He knows, listen to me, He knows what we need, He knows how we need it, and He knows when we need it. Psalm 40, 147 verse 5 says, Great is the Lord and of great power, and His understanding is infinite. You ever read Psalm 139? Psalm 139 is an amazing psalm. David, you know what David said? He said, it doesn't matter if I ascend to the highest of heavens, guess what? God is there. If I ascend to the lowest of earth, guess what? God is there. God knows everything I need. He knows when I need it. And He knows how I need it. I know some of you have been thinking over the last several weeks, Brother Mark, why hadn't I won the, why hadn't I won the lottery? Because God knows you don't need it. Well, I need that money, yeah, but you don't need it like the lottery, because if you did, you, you wouldn't be here this morning, probably. I need it. Listen to me, God knows what you need, when you need it, and how you need it. There's no lack of awareness or ability on God's part. Now here's, stay with me for a minute, I'm going to give you some scripture, I need you to go back and read them. His plans may not always be discoverable by man. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 through 9 says, Our ways are not His ways, our thoughts are not His thoughts. But that's not, listen to me, but that does not mean that God is not knowable. We may not always understand what God is doing or know what God is doing, but that does not mean we can't know God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12, listen to me. Now ye have received, not the Spirit of this world, but the Spirit which is of God, that ye may know the things that are freely given to us of God. So guess what he's saying there? Paul is saying, what you need to know, God's going to give it to you. Just trust Him. You may not know everything, God does, and God's going to let you know what you need to know. Hmm. 
We have to submit to Him. We've got to trust Him. We'll never, listen to me, I, there's some things we'll never know or understand about God. I'm sorry. That's why we're told to walk by what? Faith and not by sight. So there's some things I'm never going to understand. I'm never going to fully grasp all the purposes of God. They're beyond my understanding. Read Isaiah chapter 55, verses 6 through 9. There's some things I'll never understand why. Some people have asked me, Brother Mark, do you know why this happened? Listen to me. We'll never know this side of heaven. But listen to me. When we get to heaven, it won't matter. All the whys that we're asking right now, they won't matter when we get to heaven. So what, is my, what, is my, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to trust God. I can depend on God. I can trust Him. Oh, it gets better. Go back to my text in Isaiah. Because he said, listen to He giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, He increases strength. Guess what? I can depend on God because He's a generous God. How many of y'all like people that are generous? Amen, I do. Come on now. I like people who are generous. God is a generous God. There's a lot of people that somehow or another look at God in the day and culture that we live in right now and see Him as just this tight-fisted, mean, angry person who's just waiting to destroy your life and wants to persecute you. And Now, I'm not trying to teach you health, wealth, prosperity gospel. That's what I'm trying, not trying to tell you. But I'm here to tell you, we have a generous God. A generous God. God has, an, listen to me, God has an excess of strength for those who need it. That's what He says. And He's willing to give it to anybody who asks. So if you need strength today, you know what God's saying? Just ask. i got plenty. I'll give it to you. If you will just trust me, if you will just ask. Now listen to me, God doesn't need us. God is, not, uh, God is a God who's not, uh, uh, is non-contingent. That means uh, he's, he's self-existent. He doesn't need anything from us, but we need Him. God is a giving God. Brother how do you know that? Well, I look around me and I know it, but think for a moment. From Genesis to Revelation, you know what God did? He gave. Think about it for a minute. He gave life to Adam and Eve, right? And to every living creature that's walking the face of the earth. God gave life. He gave protection to Noah. He gave a promise to Abraham. He gave provision to Israel. He gave a Savior to the world. He gave heaven to the redeemed. Amen? God is constantly giving. God is still giving today. See, those who understand the benefit of this great giving God are those who, first of all, will admit their weakness and ask. See, you're not going to ever understand a giving God until you admit you need God and you ask. Then you're going to see the generosity of God. You're going to see a God that gives. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 says this, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Wow. Most gladly, therefore, I'd re I will glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Listen to me. Until you admit you are weak and you need God, you'll never see the generosity of God. You'll never see the grace of God. You'll never understand the power of God. You'll never understand the justness of God. None of those things until you say, Lord, I need you. And then watch what happens. God will flood your life. You believe that today? James chapter 1 says this, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Listen to me. Who giveth to all men liberally, generously. Well, Brother Mark, I don't know what to do. Ask God. I don't know the decision I need to make. Ask God. In fact, James goes on and said, Not only does he give it generously and upbraideth not. That means he's not resentful. He wants you to ask. James chapter 1, verse 17, carrying on, listen to me. Every good and perfect gift come from God. And comes down for the Father of lights, to whom there is no variables, neither shadow of turning. So listen to me. God is a generous God. He wants to give to you today. The only way He can do that is if you ask. Christ told us this very same truth. Ask and it shall be what? Given. 
But if you don't ask, God can't give. What do you need today? What do you need in your life? What are you battling with? What are you struggling with today? I'm here to tell you that whatever you need, God's got plenty of it. <laughs> but what you've got to do is ask. Admit your weakness. Admit your need. And come to God. And when He says, you come, I'm a giving God. Need I remind you, stay with me just for a minute. For God so loved the world that He His only begotten Son. That whosoever believeth in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. God gave. He gave you life. Physical life. He'll give you eternal life. He'll give you abundant life. He'll give you the wisdom that you need. He'll give you the understanding that you need. He'll give you the grace that you need if you simply ask. Go back to my text. In verse 30 and 31, it says, Even the youth shall faint. You know, at our best, we're just, we're just moral. Well, at our best... We're infallible. I mean, we're fallible. We're going, to call, we're going to have mistakes. And I hate to tell you, and we've been reminded of it much too often over the last several weeks, but we will die one day. At our best, look at verse 30. Youth, we're going to faint. We're going to go grow weary, even the young do. So at our best, our, we have physical limitations. And listen to me, if we have no relationship with an everlasting God, we should live in fear. But as the children of God, because we have a relationship with an eternal, everlasting, omniscient, omnipotent God, because we have a relationship with Him, we should not live in fear. How is that possible, Brother Mark? Go to verse 31. But they that wait upon the Lord. The word wait has, is, is just is a, is a powerful word in Scripture. Wait gives me two truths that I want to just share with you just for a minute. The word wait means complete dependence upon God. I have no other argument. I have no other plea. I have no other help, not in myself or outside of myself. I completely depend upon God. Are you there? See, until we admit that we're helpless, God cannot truly act the way that He wants to. Are you completely dependent upon God today? See, I know in the back of your mind what you're thinking, man. I, I got this going on. I got that going on. I can take care of this. I can take care of that. Listen to me. Until you realize and God, you can come to the point in your life where you understand you are completely dependent upon God, then you'll begin to see this God you can depend upon. Now, I don't know what God's got to do to get us to that point. Till we realize we are helpless. I can't do it. Nobody around me can do it. Until we realize only God can do a work in my life. Only God can meet this need. Only God can provide what I need. Until you come to that point, God really can't work in your life. Are you completely dependent upon God? Now stay with me because here's the second part. I've got to be willing to allow Him to decide the terms of my life. Whew. If I say I'm going to wait on God, I've got to trust, I've got to depend on Him. But then I've got to be willing to allow Him to decide what my life should look like. How I should live it. Man. I've got to have complete confidence and His actions, and what He wants me to do, and where He wants me to go. And what He puts into my life, i got to trust Him. That's hard. 
Lord, whatever it takes, whatever i got to do, whatever comes my way, I'm going to trust you. Man, those are words, but when they come to where the rubber meets the road, man, it's hard. God, I'm going to let you decide what my life looks like. I'm going to let you decide what's true. I'm going to let you decide how I'm going to live. Man, that's a hard life right there. Are you willing to do that? You see, a lot of people just say, well, y'all, you people that have faith in God, man, that's just a crutch. That's just a crutch. That's just for you to way to get through some difficult times in your life. Listen to me. My faith in God is not just waiting, killing time. I have a confident expectation that God is going to do exactly what He said and God is going to provide and God's going to give me everything I need. I'm not just killing time. I'm waiting to see what God's going to do and it's going to be great. Because He's God. And He's just and He's fair and He's tireless and He's generous and I'm willing to wait to see what God's going to do because I'm going to be amazed by it. I'm not just killing time. I'm not just going through the day. I'm not just walking through this life because I'm amazed and I see what's described in Scripture and I can't wait to see what God is doing. Paul said, your eye hath not seen or even entered into the mind of what God has prepared for man. Aren't you looking forward to that? I'm not just killing time. I'm trusting God that every promise is true. And His Word is true. And what He said is going to happen. I believe heaven is real. And it is worth it all. And I will trust Him. I can depend on Him. I can trust Him. And guess what? He's patient. Even when I fail, He's patient. You see, those people who are willing to give up the frantic, useless efforts to save themselves and turn to God will be able to replace that worn out strength for a new God-given strength that will carry them not only through this life but through eternity. Are you just wore out? I think Israel was there. They said, listen, we've been in captivity for 70 years. We've been beating our head against the wall. We don't know what to do. We're, we're exhausted. We're tired. We're worn out. I ain't got nothing left, Brother Mark. There's nothing left. Maybe that's where God wants you. Maybe that's where He needed you so that you would finally trust Him. You see, the last two phrases of verse 31 imply an entirety of life full of strength and an ability to live a life that pleases God. See, I'm not talking about a life of just existing. Look what it says there in our text. I'm talking about a life, that, that one of soaring and running. They're going to soar like eagles. They're going to run and not be weary. They're going to walk and not faint. That's the life I want. I don't want a life of just existence. I don't want a life of just struggling day to day. Listen to me. I want to have a life that's pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Why? Because of what Christ is doing in me. And I trust Him and I love Him. I don't want to just exist. Why are you going through that life? You don't have to. You know why you're going through that life? Because you're depending on you. You're trusting in you. You're trusting in things. Power, money, prestige, all those things. That's what you're trusting in. And guess what? You're exhausted and you're tired and you want to give up. And I'm here to tell you, trust God. <laughs> Depend upon Him. Will you do that this morning? Because guess what? God's waiting on you. He don't want you just to exist. He said, I come to give you life and give you life more abundantly. Do you want that abundant life? Or do you just want to exist? Lord, how can I do that? I'm going to trust God. Because He's just. He's fair. He's the creator of heaven and earth. 
I can trust Him. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He knows all things. He's all-powerful. He's patiently waiting on me to trust Him. And if I will wait on Him, if I will surrender my life to Him, if I will be completely dependent upon God and allow Him to live, show me the path of life, guess what? There is abundant, everlasting life. Are you depending on God today? Are you depending on yourself? This world. You know, in Celebrate Recovery, they talk about being codependent. That you live your life waiting for the approval of someone else. I'm not asking you to be codependent. I'm asking you to be dependent upon God. Not a priority in your life, but the priority in your life. And then watch what God will do. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for the Word of God. Lord, sometimes we're just worn out, tired. The battle's been long, hard. Life just makes us tired. We're exhausted. Lord, most of the times we find that has happened because we began to trust in other things besides you. Trusted in our 401k, our retirement program, our plans for the future. When we see them slipping away, we fight harder and harder, and it just seems like we're drowning deeper because life's not working out the way it's supposed to. Truth is, we never depended on you. Truth is, we never waited upon you. We rushed ahead or we lagged behind what you wanted in our life. We didn't live out the truth of the Word of God. Because of that now, we find ourselves in a very difficult situation. So Lord, today I pray for those that are sitting here that they'll ask themselves the question, what am I depending on? Health? Money? Another person. Some other person to complete me, to make my life what it needs to be. Or am I trusting on God? Lord, you told us in your word that if we seek first the kingdom of God, all these things shall be added unto us. The things we desire, the things that, that you want for our life. Lord, you're waiting. You're a generous God. You're, you're desiring to give them to us. A great home, a healthy marriage great family peace and joy Lord they're all waiting for us in Jesus Christ this world is snatched from us so quickly what we thought would be something there forever is gone so Lord help us to turn to you today to trust you to depend upon you Lord, when we do that, when we acknowledge that, God, what you can do and will do in our lives it will be amazing. Your grace is sufficient. We trust. There is peace for those who depend upon God. Lord, help us today. Lord, if there's anyone here who does not know you, they're just worn out. Life is hard. They're exhausted and they're tired and they need you today. God, help them to trust you, to save you their life. I'm going to ask you to stand just for a moment, your head bowed, your eyes closed. Maybe you want to just come into the altar and pray. Lord, help me. I'm tired. I'm tired. Won't you come? Oh, to Jesus. I'm tired, Brother Mark. I'm exhausted. Oh, I'm tired of the fight. I'm tired of the battle. I need you. I will ever Help us. I cannot figure this out. I don't understand. His presence God, I need you right now. Ask Him. I Cry out to Him. Surrender all. He's waiting. He's waiting for you. I
head bowed just for a moment. As these pray here at the altar, you may want to come pray with them just for a minute. Did you listen to the words you just sang? I surrender all. You know what that word means? All. It means all. You don't hold nothing back. Nothing is held back. I surrender everything. My plans, my dreams, my desires, my passions, my thoughts, my energy, my talents, my resources. God, I surrender it all to you. My life is yours. Can you sing that this morning? Have you really surrendered all to Him? What are you holding back? What are you holding back this morning? We're going to sing one more verse. This is for you. What are you holding back from God? Oh, I surrender Jesus, all. Jesus, I you done that? surrender. Make me Savior, holy thine. Have you Let surrendered all? God's people said. I think there's an announcement that needs to be made. Stephanie, if you will, come up. And uh, after that, Brother Phil, don't forget tomorrow night to celebrate recovery. Women Action for Christ, don't forget that. Stephanie's going to remind you as well. Look in your bulletin, a lot of announcements, okay? Yes, we're having church tonight. In case you didn't know that, we will. And so just come on back. We'll worship together the Lord again this evening. The WAC, Women's Action for Christ, we would like to invite everyone out, all the women out to this next meeting um, this next Saturday on the 19th at 10 o'clock. We'll be in the fam uh, Family Life Center up there. We're actually going to be making cookies. We would like you to bring any little ones with you. Um, bring your rolling pins and your cookie cutters and we'll have some fun fellowship time together. Thank you. <laughs> the everlasting God, the everlasting God. You do not faint, you both grow weary. You're the defender of the weak. You comfort those in need. You lift us up on wings like eagles. Ha, ha, ha.